is with changing mindset, is with changing our language. Um, I want you to consider, again, the microcosm of Over the Rhine. A lot of times you have two different groups that now, that venture into Over the Rhine. You have the group, the maybe liberal, maybe conservative group that comes in and says, hey, we're going to stand on the corner, we're going to pass out food today, we're going to pass out coats today, we're going to do all of these things today uh, because these poor souls in Over the Rhine need it. And then you have the other group that comes in and says, predominantly as a smoke screen, like I said earlier, but says, we're going to bring in people that have created businesses and know how to do it, and then everybody else will learn from them, learn how to live. And to me, both sides create a problem, because both sides say that this group of people is either less than me, so I need to help them in some way, or I need to teach them in some way, or I need to take over their neighborhood because they can't run it themselves. Or we say, and it's not very different from saying, uh, I don't want these folks in my neighborhood because they don't know how to run a neighborhood. They're going to drag it down. They're going to steal from me. They're going to do all of these things. It, it is all the same conversation. And I believe the way we begin to change it is to realize that, hey, every human has basic needs. We all, we all have the same, same general desires. And, uh, and we get rid of this fear of each other. We get rid of this idea that I can make your life better simply because who, who you are and who I am. Uh, I think that's the start. I just want to add one compliment to that. The um, changing one's mindset, changing one's social consciousness, consciousness uh, changing one's conscience. Um, these are good things. I agree with that, but, but you, that's very hard to do. What this means, I think, if social being actually determine social consciousness, what you have to do is get yourself into a place. You have to join something. You have to get yourself into a place where these kinds of ideas are actually nurtured. How about the revolutionary ideas? Revolutionary ideas of empathy. One of the things I learned at the Over the Rhine Community Housing Fundraiser that was just a few weeks ago where poets were uh, giving a presentation, they said something that was extremely powerful and hit me right between the eyes. They said, seek out seek out those most oppressed, those most exploited, so that you may learn how to live. I mean, are we not our brother's keeper? Um, do we think about uh, sharing wealth so that all can have a, can have a piece of the pie? Uh, apparently we don't. Um, this is a totally driven kind of society, um, but you know, so this is why I say revolutionary idea about love one another and our, I am my brother's keeper. You know, these are values and ideas that are nurtured in certain places, by the way. They are nurtured in certain organizations. This is my attraction to the people's movement. I'm, I'm attracted by those values that are developed in that context. To ensure that your questions are valuable not only to the audience, but also to the video recording, if you'll move to either side of the aisle, and we'll go in alternate order. So we'll start with Emily Hugh on the left-hand side, and then come back here. Can I just sit here? Is that okay? Of course. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I had a couple comments and then, and then a real simple question. Um, I get my first comment is it's been really interesting um, and just to, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I do work on race and gender and law. So it, it's been really interesting to sit here listening to you guys, you all, talking and to hear, to not hear sort of explicit references to race a couple times, um, but not very explicit references to, to, to race and interconnectivity of race and class as real trenchant social stratification problem. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't mean to over-reduce to race, just as I don't think we should over-reduce to class, but it's just been something I've noticed. Um, the second remark is one about, um, I've been starting to look at poverty just a little bit in my own scholarship, and I'm sure that you guys have looked at it pretty extensively, but um, you know, I think one of the really huge problems that perhaps we can't address in in this today is the issue of poverty in general and sort of what we want to do about it. <laughs> because I think that, um, like, I've been serving on this poverty task force, and you know, the 
one of the things that people have been talking about on this task force is that we need to figure out a way to talk about poverty without talking about poor people because, you know, nobody really wants to talk about poor people and so we've just got to frame it as, you know, it's about jobs or it's about this or it's about that. And to me, that doesn't make any sense to me to kind of talk about getting rid of poverty without talking about the poor and sort of why our, our economic system depends on poverty. Um, and, or at least an impoverished class. And then, um, so those were just two comments, but, um, and there's so many other things that are involved, like the war on drugs and all of that kind of thing. But um, I'm actually wondering if there are any examples of neighborhoods in Cincinnati that are functional mixed, economically mixed. Thank you. Um, so I, again, I can't recite a list, but what I would refer people to, um, if you've heard of an organization called Housing Opportunities Made Equal, HOME, uh, for short, they every year put out a, a kind of magazine with a list of local neighborhoods that are, uh, diverse in a healthy way. Uh, so that's, and they actually have one that is coming out here in the next month or so. Um, I would, I would definitely refer people there and to their website. Just Google Housing Opportunities Made Equal Cincinnati. Thanks. Um, there was a reference this morning to the Tarbell mural, right? Um, my students uh, last year, the year, I forget when, and Chris Wilkie is in the room here. His students, my students, and um, what was the name of the professor from uh, Chetfield College? I forgot her name. Uh, but our three different universities um, decided to do a, a campaign to take a look at that mural to try and find out what people thought about it as an art criticism kind of project. It was promised to be something that was going to be a democratic process and so forth. It never really happened that way. Apparently the decision for that mural was made mostly by white men, realtor developer types. This story is written up. Um, our students found that when they engage people on the street about what does this mural mean to you, what do you think is being said here, and they went all over, over the Rhine. The one thing that came out very clearly was that African Americans in particular felt threatened. They, they felt that displacement is coming and, uh, and if it's not actually happening. Uh, in particular, in particular, African Americans more than, than other groups felt that uh, their time in this neighborhood is very short. So that's, uh, that reminds me a little bit about um, what Nikki Taylor, Professor Nikki Taylor put on the table this morning in the historian section when she talks about a kind of whiteness that's being reproduced through gentrification, and you know, kind of an answer to your question, and I think that's absolutely the case. That's what's happening here. There's kind of a sanitized playground, whitish kind of thing. I mean, and she said objectively that you know, when people come down there, it's mostly white people down there. It's not African Americans or other people of color down there. Hi, Kelsey Hillbrand again. Um, I guess <laughs> I'm opening up this question because I feel that having. Josh and Peter on this panel, who are two very involved residents of Rhine. I think this is an important question for you guys. Um, something that I feel like has been lacking in the conversation today, it goes around what the current residents of Over the Rhine have to offer. I get so much of this has been around like what development could potentially or not do for this population, but what does this population have to offer? It's a pretty general question they have to offer in terms of skills. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you don't want to you don't want to bite on every hook that's thrown your way. I appreciate your provocative question. I think uh, over the Rhine, like every other community in this city and probably in the world, offers a range of uh, people, ages, genders, skill sets. The problem, I think, or one of the problems here is that no one looks at them as a resource or as an asset. 
And as, as you know, Josh has been working uh, to try and